of Colombia, and there's a lot of dispute about cumbia, the dance, and whether it started in Panama or whether it started in Colombia. Um, it actually kind of it doesn't matter because it was the same country at, at one point. Um, the Caribbean Sea, Col Colombia touches both the Caribbean Sea and the Pacific Ocean. And uh, because of the way that the country is arranged, there are um, these dances that are connected to the different um, oceans. Um, cumbia, this is kind of a side note, is actually danced one way on the Caribbean coast and it's danced a little bit differently on the Pacific coast. So I thought that was very interesting um, as well. So um, the question, what led me to Colombia, this idea of Zumba, right? So I, I explained that whole certification. And if you've never done it, it's a very easy way for you to try um, dances from other parts of the world. The more advanced Zumba, you start to do things like belly dancing and samba from Brazil and different dances from Mexico. It's really fun the more advanced you get. Um, but also <laughs> Dr. DePaolo, who is Associate Professor of Spanish, some of you know Dr. DePaolo, um, he has been going to Colombia for the past three years presenting at a conference. Um, and so that helped that he was going to Colombia in September. It wasn't an accident that I went in September. He was presenting at a conference and I was like, hey, can I go with? And I went with him. So it helped to have someone who was a native speaker of Spanish. I will say, my high school Spanish came in handy. I was able to get around pretty well. Um, I was pretty adventurous to not be a native speaker. Um, but having him there was helpful because he was able to help negotiate some things for me. Um, and also, um, Professor Rennerfeld, who's here, um, she actually has a friend who lives in the city that I was going to who was a dancer. And so she was able to put me in contact with, um, her name is Claudia Sedena, and uh, she was able to help me a lot. She was able to connect me to a lot of things while I was visiting. So there were a lot of connections that led me there, and it all just happened to work out. Um, it was very um, serendipitous in that sense. So we have to, of course, we're talking about these African influences, so we need to talk a little bit about slavery in general, um, African slavery, um, and of course it's Black History Month, not accidental, for the timing of why we're having this discussion. Um, it is part of the uh, African, Black History Month events for the center, the cultural center. And this is also, I want to, I have to point out, Daisy is here from, she's the director of the Hispanic Cultural Center. She helped me put this together, so thank you, Daisy. Um, it's sponsored by both Daisy and um, the African American Cultural Center and the Department of Theater and Dance. So thank you to everyone who helped put this together. Um, I think here in the United States, uh, African Americans in general forget that there was slavery in more places than just in the United States and in the South. Um, it, it's actually existed throughout North and South America, Central America, the Caribbean. Um, so there's a much bigger history involved and it's important to talk about that and it's important to acknowledge it and to also think about the differences, the way that um, slavery was handled in these different areas and it also depended on what nation or the, the colonizer was from, right? So Spanish slavery is different than British slavery is different than Dutch slavery. There were some, these slight differences between those nations um, and the way that they handled what was happening and what was called the New World, what was happening here in the United States. Um, so lots of, lots of connections. Um, and it's, it's again, like for, for myself, sometimes I forget, oh, there are a lot, there are millions of black people in Colombia and Brazil in Uruguay, in the Caribbean, in Mexico. Um, there's a, an entire village in Mexico um, where there was a slave ship that, that crashed and the survivors ended up in this little area in Mexico and they have their own, their own life. They, they have their own culture that's very different than the rest of what we consider to be Mexican culture. So there are all these very interesting connections that, that are happening throughout the Americas. Um, that was very interesting as well when I was in and Colombia, you can't just say American. What, what, does it, what does that mean? We say American and we're talking about our identity, but people in South America consider themselves American as well. They are American, Canadians are American because it's about the continent 
using the word America and, and talking about the continent. Um, slavery was not abolished in Colombia until 1851. It's earlier than in the United States, but they had a very different reaction. Um, it was not a good thing to, to be of African descent in 1851. So they abolished slavery, and what ended up happening, um, and I think it's very interesting, is that those slaves ended up going to the jungles to hide. It was a way to, you move to the jungle, you move to an area where no one's going to bother you, and that's what they did. They went and they hid, and in some ways, I have a theory that that's one of the reasons why some of these dances continue to exist. Um, they, they were forced to live in the jungle area, areas, and it was a form of self-protection. Um, there was also this idea that one of the ways to deal with the race issues was let's just try to, to whiten everyone. Let's just take the, the idea of racial mixing and get everyone kind of about the same as a, as, as a solution so that we don't have this very different world where there are white people, people of European descent, people of kind of what we would consider native descent or indigenous people. We want pe everyone to look the same. So there was this whole effort to kind of whiten um, the population so that there would be less issues. Very different than what happened in the United States. Um, and so also, it's, a, it's an interesting variation. Um, and that has happened in a lot of, especially the Spanish um, colonies. There was this idea of Hispanidad, um, where they were just going to try to get everyone to be about the same hue. Um, it's a very interesting way to deal with race relations. Um, and it's very different than, than our version. So we have all of these, these dance forms that, that survived. I'm very interesting in, interested in why they survived. So you all know about samba, which is from Brazil. Um, we have bachata from Dominican Republic. We have the salsa, which is Puerto Rican, and also New York. They both fight over which one started salsa, this idea of salsa, and you can find salsa <laughs> all over the, the, the Caribbean, Central America, South America, North America. They all fight about who started salsa. That's a whole different discussion. Um, merengue from the Dominican Republic. Tango from Argentina and Uruguay. Again, don't think of tango as having an African root but it does. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, cumbia, Colombia kind of takes ownership of starting cumbia or, or keeping cumbia alive. There are cumbias from all over Latin America, but we want to focus on the, the Colombian version. And then the Mapale, again, is from Colombia. This is a short list. This is kind of what we can deal with in this little time period that we're together. Then we have what happened in the U.S.? So another set of questions that I have. Um, what happened to these dance forms? Um, there, there were jigs. There were cakewalks. Have any of you heard of a cakewalk? Um, perhaps maybe you did a cakewalk in elementary school. My elementary school used to have these cakewalks, and you walk around in a circle, and it's kind of like musical chairs, and whoever ends up at, at the end with a chair wins a cake, an actual physical cake. Well, that, that tradition is much older and has a very different beginning, and it, it's a dance beginning. And so um, I've always been interested in cakewalk, um, things like buck and wing, the ring dances, the juba. My question is, where are these dances today? Why did these dances not survive in the same way that cumbia has survived in Colombia? Um, the, the most interesting thing to me when I was there with my limited Spanish Alone, most of the time, Dr. Papalo was like presenting, and so I would wake up in the morning and say, "Okay, I gotta go find a dance class to take. I gotta go find the stuff." Um, if I said the word cumbia to anyone, anyone on the street, they would start. They start to move. They start to do something, and they their face lights up, and they have something to say about it. Very different in the United States, right? I mean, people we know. We know some dances, right, in the United States, but there's not a national dance that everyone is connected to, right? Uh, maybe line dancing, right? 
We, we all, most people could do the electric slide if they were forced to or they, they've seen it before, right? Um, some people would argue that tap dance is American, this American form that everybody knows or at least understands. They may not be able to do it, but they can identify it. Um, but there, it's very different. Um, and when I say I was able to make connections with people and we could communicate, if I said Cumbia, they were willing to help walk me to wherever I needed to go to make sure that I got what I was looking for. Um, and they were so impressed when I was able to figure out how to do some, some of the steps. I mean, they were just like, oh, so good, it's so amazing. Um, it's also very interesting, too, to be in a country where there's been so much racial mixing. Um, there's every shade in the rainbow in Colombia. It's very um, interesting to see. Um, and no one, there was not a single person there who assumed I was American. Mm -hmm. They just knew I was Colombian. They would walk up to me, start speaking Spanish, and I would have to stop them and say, no, I'm an American, and you could, their faces would drop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're like, please tell me, say it ain't so. <laughs> and it was like, it was so disappointing, and I, I was writing, I'm looking at Dr. Sorensen in the back who teaches French, I'm like, I have to learn Spanish, I have to be fluent, I can't go somewhere and not be able to communicate. Um, I have a whole thing about, I have to be able to like go somewhere and not be a visitor, I hate that whole tourist thing. Um, so it was exciting to be assumed that, you know, they just assumed I was Colombian, but I really wasn't. Um, and the little kids at the dance studio that I was taking classes, they asked if I was a gringo. That was like my favorite highlight of the trip. So they asked my teacher, is he a gringo? They asked just like that, and, and she was like, she started laughing, I just died laughing. I was like, I'm not a gringo, but I mean, I guess I am. And they, they were like, why is he speaking so much English? They said, in English, why is he speaking so much English? <laughs> So that's all I speak. So everyone who's here, learn another language. Please, for the love of all things that are holy, learn another language because it, it matters when you want to travel outside the U.S. Um, so back to back to this stuff. So the 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 next question is folk dance. What is folk dance? Um, again, in the United States, we don't really have a folk dance tradition per se. We don't have uh, an identity. Can you all tell? This is interactive. Who? What? What's? What is American folk dance? What do we have? The cha cha slide. The cha cha slide. Okay, so line dancing, square line dancing, dance. square dancing, square maybe a Western style square dance. The hokey pokey. The hokey pokey. <laughs> Isn't the hokey pokey like a polka? It's kind of a po polka. Everyone knows it here, though. Yeah, but what else? Exactly. There's not a whole lot. I, I've had many conversations with Professor Renderfeld, with uh, Brian Brenner, who's chair of theater and dance. We've had these really long conversations about what is American folk dance. Um, oh, there's some. There's a hand. Well, it wasn't until like the 20s that America actually got established as a place for dancing, the Fox Trot. Okay, so the the formal the ballroom dances. Yeah. Sure. Okay, I, I would agree with that. But how many of you all can Fox Trot? <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. I mean, it, so so it it America has this identity. I think of exporting dance ideas, ideas about dance. We we're good at coming up with a craze, the cha cha slide, the wobble. We know what the wobble is. Everybody's heard it. They've seen it at a party or at a wedding. But how long is the wobble going to be in? It's kind of already over. Right? When I hear the wobble, when I go out now, I'm not going to lie, I'm like over it. It's too long, I'm just like, it's the same thing over and over again. There'll be another dance craze that will replace it. So we're good at exporting these ideas, but we're not really good at holding on to something and having it be attached to our, our identity as Americans. Um, so folk dance is a traditional dance originating among the common people of a nation or region. We, we really don't have one using that definition, right? A dance that originates as ritual and is characteristic of the common people of a country is transmitted from generation to generation with increasing secularization. Um, so it, it kind of keeps getting more and more easy as, as, the time, as time goes on. So what dances did you learn from your parents that you would say was passed down to you? Or from your grandparents? Huh, the waltz? 
Per yeah, maybe some of the ballroom dances. Mm -hmm. But as as if I'm looking at this room of people, all of these shining faces, we don't have one dance form that we would all say we agree with as our American dance. Um, it's, 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 I don't know, it, I think it kind of bothers me. <laughs> so, in Colombia, there, so, there are very, very many folk dances and a lot of it has to do with the different regions. Um, the cumbia, we've talked a little bit about, we'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment. Um, the mapale, which is distinctly from the Caribbean region, um, it, it, if you were to see it, actually I'll pull up a, a video example, it looks and feels and sounds just like anything you would see in West Africa. Any, throw a dart at a country in West Africa and that's what mapale movement looks like. Um, it's very interesting, direct, direct contact and it's still performed. Um, and it's, uh, my, my teacher, she was very interesting because she had studied a lot of these folk dances and had performed in some folk dance companies in Medellin. Um, she said, Mapale is always performed by the dark-skinned Colombians. So there, there's this connection that obviously it must be related to, to Africa. They, only the dark-skinned people do Mapale. So she was able to, to give me a lesson in Mopoli, but she didn't feel like she could give, be as pure because it wasn't, it wasn't, she would never be allowed to perform it. Um, she, that's, that's not something that she was allowed to do. Um, Bambuco, uh, which is from the, the Andes region, uh, Medellin is in the mountains, it's in a valley. Um, it's very interesting flying in um, to this very mountainous area, and then it was like another hour to get to the city, and you go over a mountain and down a giant hill and then it's this huge city that's, you know, millions and millions of people. It's kind of like arriving in New York City but surrounded by mountains. Absolutely gorgeous. Not what I was expecting. Um, but the, the mountain culture, the Andean culture is very much infused. Bambuco is interesting because it's a blending. Um, the, the drums that are used are African drums. Um, but the movement is very much um, what you would expect from uh, the Andean indigenous people, the people that were from the mountain region. So it's very interesting, this fusion between the musical instruments and the movement. Um, Jaropo is from the Pacific region, um, and it is like a um, horse, horse dance. The music is very fast. It's very down. If you were to see videos of it, I mean, and it doesn't stop. Uh, it's very interesting. It's very, it was difficult because it's so fast. So it's supposed to be like a horse running. Um, and the Pacific region. It was, it was great to learn about. But they also do salsa. The Cali region of Colombia, they have their own version of salsa that's very different, it's very fast. Lots of footwork. Um, it's very, they have all these salsa competitions um, that, that happen in the Cali region. So salsa is huge there. Um, I did try to go to a salsa place. Um, it was like the second night I was there. So I'll tell you this whole story. Get in the cab, going to the salsa place by myself. Don't speak the language. Um, and it's downtown. So the hotel I was staying at is in the, this very posh region, um, or part of the city. Um, so I take this cab, and as we get closer and closer downtown, the economic situation changes drastically <laughs> as I get to this place. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, I don't speak Spanish. I have to get a cab home. What is going to happen? So, but I was like, I was in it, so I was going to go and have the salsa experience. So we get there, the place is closed. I breathed a sigh of relief. The, and the cab driver looked at me and was like, I'll take you home. <laughs> I'd just gotten there, I was not prepared. By the end, by the time I was leaving, I was downtown every night by myself, I was fine. But the first night I was very traumatized. I mean, I, there, there was a, a, a big cultural difference. Um, again, that was an eye-opening experience for me to see um, poverty different than American poverty. It's very different. A uh, lot, hundreds of people outside, sleeping outside, not just one or two people, you know, under a bridge the way we see things in the U.S. Not that way at all. So it's very eye-opening, and I learned I learned something from that experience. 
They dance bachata there, they dance fandango there, they dance reggaeton there, um, and it, they just move effortlessly through these, these forms. Um, so that, that part was really exciting. Um, so Mapale, I mentioned it was brought over um, by African slaves who were mainly from Angola. Um, so there is a connection, this direct connection between Angola, West Africa, and Colombia, the, the Caribbean coast. Um, so that's where Mapale comes from. It stands both in the Pacific and the Caribbean region, but there's a difference. Um, and it's a courtship dance between the men and the women. A lot of these dances have courtship built into them. Um, the movement is considered to be frenetic. Um, I didn't think it was frenetic, but you know, maybe someone who hasn't had a lot of experience with viewing um, West African dance may seem like they're like it's frenetic, but it's supposed to be based on the Mapale fish out of water. So that made a lot of sense to me. If you're going to describe it as frenetic, then yeah, it's a, a fish out of water is kind of flopping around. So it actually helped me to see that that definition for Mapale. Um, and all of the examples I've found, it is, it is just West African dance. If you were to take West African dance in the United States and go and say you wanted to perform Mapale in Colombia, you would fit right in. There would be very little difference um, between the two. So it's very um, interesting to see it that way. Um, I'm gonna, I have a little bit of uh, Mapale music for you to hear and then oh I need to introduce my dancers so my dancers come and stand up they all have on these white dresses um, so you will know that the spring dance concert is next week right um, next week Wednesday we open and it runs through Sunday afternoon at 2 um, so one of the dances that's in the dance concert is this Afro-Colombian fusion piece that I, I made for based on my experience and made for the dance concert, so you all should come so that you see the full costumes. They're not fully costumed, but you know, the women have the long circular dresses that they use when they're moving. Um, the men usually have some type of hat, um, so Shamar has his hat, um, and so, and they manipulate it. So um, I'm gonna just play a little bit of the music and then we'll do, um, why don't we do the section where you all come together. That's what I told you we were gonna do. The jump, jump, turn around, that part. Okay. Okay. Just, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop you. But look, I'm just gonna start this music so you can hear it. population at the time now no not so much at all I mean everybody it didn't matter like I said it didn't matter who they were they understood cumbia and they they had a an affinity for it they they felt strongly about it um, the connection to slavery one leg is dead because it would have been shackled um, so that's interesting it's courtship but still this connection to to being shackled to the person in front of you and the person behind you um, it has its roots in Ghanaian kumbe music, so um, from from West Africa. So that's where 
where the music and the rhythm comes from. And as a courtship, the women had their long skirts, so they would wave their skirts back and forth. The men are trying to look under their skirts. Um, there's a playful element, and the men would usually have some type of handkerchief um, that they would be using. And, uh, and their hats, they always have a hat. Um, so the, the men are taking their hat on and off, or they're putting their hat over their heart, um, and they're trying to get the woman to take their handkerchief. So they're kind of waving this handkerchief around and hoping that one of the women will take it. The women never take the handkerchief. Um, so they never win, and, and the modern version, they never win, they never get the girl. Um, in the old version, there's also a candle portion. I didn't get to see the candle per portion. You can see it, you know, if you go to YouTube and you want to know more, you type in Cumbia. You can see that the, the women have these candles, and they're holding the candles as they're, as they're moving. Um, very interesting. Um, let's see, this, is, this slide just says uh, about the male dancer had the red handkerchief wrapped around their necks and then they would take it off and wave it around. Um, and what I loved reading about was that until the 1950s or so, it was considered bad to perform cumbia because that was for low class people. Only the lower class population would have been expected to dance cumbia. Now, when I, everyone, even the, like the guy, the tour guide that picked me up from the airport, as soon as I said cumbia, we couldn't have a conversation. <laughs> I said cumbia, he took out paper and started writing down musicians that I needed to look up. Um, they have, also they have a thing, disco cumbia or electro cumbia. They're, oh, huge. Everybody does the electro cumbia. So it's very interesting to see um, that now, it's not the case at all. Everybody performs cumbia. So, let me put on some music. Dancers, are you ready? Yes. That's the, the last, um, where it's Dominique and Shamar, and then the two sides, and then you will come in. Right? Yes. Okay. Wait, you want to do this? Yeah, the whole, yeah. lesson and I was like we have to take a picture I was so excited to like be learning something and uh, I wanted to have evidence that I was <laughs> dancing in Columbia. And I was I don't know if you can see I was drenched in sweat it was like so hot and this is a great open-air studio um, so it was super warm but it was good and she worked me 
to that. She worked with me every single day that I was there after we made the connection, and uh, it was it was wonderful. Um, and we've been in contact because she's on Facebook, so like she's always asking me for videos from my rehearsal, and she wants to know how things are going, and she wants to see them and make sure that they're doing everything the right way. And I'm like, well, I can't send you a video because. It's not right, but it's okay. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's right enough, but yeah, it's, it's very, very cool. It's a great connection to have. Um, so tango, we're gonna, I'm gonna explain to you how, how tango came up in Colombia. So when you think of tango, you think of Argentina, right? Like it's so clear, it's Argentina, uh, but. It's very interesting to me that tango has African roots. Did not know that um, until I went to Colombia. So tango came from the Malongo, which came from the Kandambe. Um, so it, the Kandambe is absolutely West African. And then as it, <laughs> as it changed, it got more kind of sentimental. There's a sentimental element to it. Um, and there's a, a tango museum in Medellin. The people in, in Medellin love tango, um, and I didn't quite understand, but there's a, a guy, let me find his name. Uh, this? Leonardo Hardon, this guy. So he's a very famous tango singer. His plane crashed in the 1950s in Medellin. So he had done a concert there and he was leaving. The plane crashed in the mountains, and the people there kind of took tango and decided that they were going to own it. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's this, this tango element that's built in to Medellin, and I had no idea. Um, so that was very um, educational for me. So I went to this, this tango museum and learned about the development of, of tango. So it started at the border between what is now Argentina and Uruguay. There's a river, the Rio de la Plata, um, and what I didn't understand was that that was all one country. It was all Argentina. It wasn't until much later that they split and Uruguay became its own country and Argentina remained Argentina. And the majority of the African slaves lived in what is now Uruguay. They lived on the Uruguay side of the river. This is why we don't learn in the US that tango is related to West African music and West African dance. Had no idea. The way that it's marketed and packaged now, right, and you all know tango, it's very white, right? It's, I mean, if anybody would say that tango was European, that it was these people in, in South America trying to be more European, when actually, it's related to Africa, but it's the way that it's packaged now. So, in all of my dance training, would have never, never known. And so that was a huge eye opener to me when I was in Colombia. Um, I explained that one. So they're obsessed. There is a neighborhood at where the, the museum is. Um, they, they have a bar. It's a very well-known bar. I cannot remember the name of it. Um, but it's, it's a pool hall. So it's, you know, it's a pretty big, bar that has seven or eight pool tables filled with older men, right? There were no women inside. And they just listened to tango music, old tango records, mm -hmm. and they play pool and smoke cigars mm -hmm. all day. And that's just what they do there. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting. It's like maybe three blocks away from this tango museum. And I couldn't believe it. Um, Dr. DiPaolo went with me in th that particular day. Um, and it was just so interesting to see these guys listening to this tango music and kind of it's this sentimental like mm -hmm. like pining for the way things were um, from these older men. It was, it was very interesting. Um, so I have a picture of the of Leonardo. Um, this is from the, the museum. This is a picture of him from the playbill right before his plane crashed. Um, and the, it's just a house that they have turned into a museum. Um, so they have kind of this history of tango up all the way around the whole museum. And you have to kind of start in one spot and work your way around and read. Um, it's all in Spanish. <laughs> well, a project that I would love to take on is to take all of the, the language that they have on the wall and have it translated so that when 
somebody like me shows up, we can buy the, the English language <laughs> translation. But Dr. DePaolo was with me, and so, um, and he was cracking me up because he was like, I told you that Tango was based in African, I, I told you. And I was like, well, okay, I get it now. Because as you make your way around, it explains exactly how tango music came to be and, and the relationship. And there are these little um, dioramas that an artist made that explained exactly what was going on. So it was very interesting and he was able to translate it. Those of you who have him for Spanish, by the way, he took pictures of every um, little description and that's gonna be an assignment at some point to translate. Because <laughs> he was like, this is a great assignment for students. They should be real world translating um, no. Spanish, so yes, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming your way. So this is one of the dioramas um, that was up there. It was, it was, the picture is kind of blurry. I was taking it with my cell phone, um, but it, it was very interesting. It was very eye-opening, um, and it was again, it was a great experience. So, what now? We've talked a little bit about folk dance in the U.S., but I guess. A question that I have for myself and kind of where I want to go with this research is why didn't things work out the same way here in the US? Uh, what, what was different? Was, I, I think that maybe part of it, one of my theories is that this idea of hiding and having to hide in the jungle helped to preserve some of the, the culture. Um, so there's this idea that you, you want to hold on to it because that's, that's all you have. Um, and it, it didn't necessarily happen that way here in the U.S. Um, but I guess I have all kinds of questions about why we don't have a national folk dance identity in the U.S. And if, if we did, how, how do you maintain it? How do you get someone to come from another country to Clarksville, Tennessee, and for them to say one word and to have you get this look on your face like, Oh, it's the best thing that ever happened. Um, I, I would be very interested to see what, what that is. I don't know, maybe we're too, we're focused on other things here in the U.S. We just have, we're interested in making money and being famous and we have a different identity. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm just curious about these things. I think that it can go in a lot of different directions. I would love to take students to Columbia to, to experience some of this. Um, this. This idea of folk dance, performing folk dance, um, versus, you know, we have our, our technical, our ballet, our plies, and our tendus. Um, you know, we get caught up on that here in, in the U.S. and in our dance program. We're very focused on those things. So we want people to have good technique, but folk dance is important. It's the dance of the people. Um, and I studied history in undergrad very, very interested in social history. The history of regular folks, not the kings and queens and presidents and, uh, yeah, enough is written about them. What's going on with everyday people, to me, is much more interesting and there's so, so many directions you can go with it. Um, so, I want to find out if any of you would like to try to learn some of these dances, a little physical tryout. Good, so come up, let, we're gonna, I'll have a little instruction, my dancers are gonna come and help. So we'll do that, but there's also food that's been provided, and can, can you tell me what, what it is again? Tell me about the food, because I don't want it to get cold. I forgot it was sitting over here. Daisy, tell me what it is. I can't remember what we were. So this is our Colombian inspired food. So let's eat some food, let's talk. But oh, before we do that, are there questions? I didn't ask, ask you all for questions. Yes. No, leave your shoes on. But questions about what, what I was talking about. I totally got ahead of myself. Yes. Okay, oh, this is a great question. So she was asking about um, the African dance traditions that have 
transformed into what we would say is hip hop dance today. Um, even I'll go as far as to talk about twerking a little bit. Um, and my, my colleague, Professor Renterfeld, has said twerking's been around since the beginning of time, but we've, it wasn't called twerking until here recently. Um, so I, I think it's very interesting. It's not that it died, the traditions didn't die, um, but they definitely evolved or they transformed in some way. So, yes, that, that's a great point. Did you have your hand up? Oh, I thought so. What, what else? What other questions? Are you trying to make this a program of study for like the Department of Art and the Department of Spanish? Or like well, it's something that you took on? It, right now it's personal, but I think that it would be great to be able to take students somewhere, and I'm going to say this out loud, other than London, and have them experience something very different than what happens here in the U.S. And, and for, for, to learn about art, to learn about dance, to learn about culture in a different way because it will affect the way that we view our own culture. And um, I'm part of Colombian and Peruvian. Oh, okay. And, and my mother being from Peru, uh, you know, he talked about the, the blacks hiding out in the mountains or in the forest and the hills. They are actually great contingency in Peru where they have uh, the dances. And um, they actually the box that people beat on now that's so like uh, yeah the popular yeah that's, that was actually um, put together in Peru oh so cool there's a there's more than just like there's so much in all these little countries about African culture and how it affects it. but I think it would be something interesting that you should like look into oh sure absolutely I, I was told when I was in Medellin they were like Oh, if you won't come here, you've got to come back and go to Cartagena and Barranquilla. Yeah. They have Vallenato, which is cumbia, but in a, like in a Caribbean style way. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it's cool. I mean, I have, I have to go back. Yeah. What, what else? People are diving into the food, which is good. <laughs> okay, so if you get food, come up here if you want a little lesson, hang out. I want to talk to people. So. <laughs>
You guys, I totally forgot. Um, Daisha has an announcement. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, if you are not doing anything tomorrow between the times of 10, 9, and 4 a.m., we are having a Latin night at Tarbouche, which is the hookah bar downtown. And you are more than welcome to come and dance. There will be salsa, bachata, merengue, cumbia, everything there. So if you're not doing anything, please stop by and dance.
Thank you. 